Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Reawakened Mom podcast. And I am here with my friend, Megan Anderson. How are you, Megan? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing fabulous on this beautiful, sunny spring day. I will take it any day. If you're watching on YouTube, you will see I have no sleeves on. I have a tank top on because it is like in the seventies here in April. So I will take it and you have a gorgeous sweater on. So just for inside though, I've got my shorts on. I'm ready to go outside after this. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. 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 Well, let me introduce you to our audience and then we will dive into all your goodness that I know you are just going to share with us today. So Megan Anderson is an integrative physical therapist who works with women to navigate pain associated with endometriosis. She also supports women during pregnancy and beyond, which I think is so fabulous, to help them stay connected to themselves and feel their best as they transition into motherhood. Her mind-body approach goes beyond the physical complaints to truly support her clients in a holistic way. Ah, That just sounds like the whole package right there, Megan. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. It is. Yeah, it really is. And I love how you really look at the the woman and the female as like that holistic approach. And really like when someone comes to you, it's not like, oh, okay, this is the back pain. It's in your back. Like what is actually going on? So I would love if you would start with a little bit about what actually is an integrative physical therapist. Let's start with that. Cause I don't think we've ever had one on the podcast before. So you're the first. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not always sure what to call myself because if you were to ask any of the clients that I've worked with, they would be like, it's so much more like it's physical therapy, but it's like so much more. We really dive into the things that I know you talk a lot about with just what's impacting you in your life. How full is your plate? Like, are you not doing your exercises because you're lazy or do you just have a lot on your plate right now? And the plan that we're coming up with just doesn't really suit your lifestyle, your needs, your like what's fun for you right now. So when I say integrative, I'm really taking a look at, I want to know all of those things. I want to know what it is that you aren't doing because of this physical complaint. Most people come with a, like, there's a, excuse me, there's a physical thing they come with first, right? But then like, what is it really impacting in your life? What is it that you're not taking part in or that you let go of, or that you've been told you shouldn't do anymore or be afraid of. And when we start to really kind of dig into that, like we can get into kind of understanding what it is people really want. Like, you know, like they don't want full knee range emotion and they don't, you know, like normally want like everything to just look and feel exactly the way it used to. It's like, what are you, what is it that you're really not connecting with? Is sex not feeling great? Like, do you want to go for that run with your friends because it's the thing you used to do to really connect with yourself and de-stress? Like, those are the things that I'm working on. Yeah. Um. So mm-hmm. I know we talked about this because I am a runner. And so I would always say, oh my God, like whenever I run, I have to go right to the bathroom. And you're like, yeah. let me, we should talk like this isn't really like okay let's really dive into that like what that could actually mean so will you like dive into that like what like you talked about sex like wait a second like an, you're an integrated physical therapist like why are we talking about sex with our physical therapist like talk a little bit about that because I know you have shared some with that you've helped women that maybe have had painful sex or maybe like you go to jump on a trampoline or you go for a run and there's some leakage like tell us how you help women with those issues because it's so common and we don't talk about it enough sure yeah so this is I mean I think at the, the foundation so my training is as a physical therapist so I went through all of this like you know, training to do the traditional things that we think of. And then the piece that kind of gets missed in school is the pelvic floor. So the base of the pelvis, like the part that kind of holds the top to the bottom and allows, you know, people that are female to birth babies. And, you know, that pelvic floor does a lot of other things for us. And so I have a lot of specialty training to really help women with these sensitive issues that aren't always getting asked about, or they're getting asked about in like a, like, does sex feel okay? And like, and then you move on, like, you know, like, okay, like, does it feel okay? Does it feel really good? Is it what you want? Like, you know, um, and so we can dive in and kind of figure out both physical and, you know, what is 
also kind of sometimes we get in our head too with things. So really starting to kind of understand how to unwind, how to kind of shift from like stressful, busy day into like how to be in that, in the mood for it. Yeah. Well, we can, we, I do a lot with that. Um, with pelvic floor, um, you know, that's all things from leakage to continence to like being able to jump on a trampoline and feel like everything isn't going to fall out. Yeah. Like I recently took a phone call from a woman who, you know, had given birth to her baby and was really worried because she felt some pressure, um, down below. And she called the doctor and the doctor's like, they don't always know exactly what to do, but they were like, Oh, you have a prolapse. You have to like, you can't have any more children. You can't do this. Like you can't pick up your little one that you have. And like, she called us just like, what, mm. what can I do? You know, yeah, that's not the answer. Like that doesn't feel right. Like something's I mean, not, not pick right up here. your baby. Like that's, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're going to right. Yeah. And, and to, to be told those kind of things. So what I find in the pelvic health world and the women's health world is there's a lot of fear and that fear comes from the things that we don't know. And, you know, to be able to connect with people like this woman that called and like so many other people that, that we've worked with is to be able to just like really take a look at what's going on and be like, it's actually not very serious at all. And you can do these couple of things and you're going to feel a lot better and like, just give them confidence that like, this doesn't end you having children. If that's something you're still working towards, or like you can safely carry another pregnancy, like this stuff is all really individual, but I find that a lot of my job is helping like with a reality check of like, you're afraid there's this thing going on. You've, you know, heard some scary things about it. And let's talk about what's really going on and give you some practical tips to kind of move forward and feel empowered in your body and to be able to ask better questions, um, of, of the healthcare providers to give them a little bit more direction. Um, yeah, I feel like that's, I dropped a lot there, but no, I think it, you know, it's good to start with like, what even is like, you know, the, the pelvic health, what is the pelvic floor? Because when I think of that, I'm like, oh, is that like my vagina? Is that my uterus? Like what, what all is that? Oh. I don't know. Like, I feel like you, you have sex ed and like, yes, I'm a woman, but I'm like, I I'm not even sure. Like when I first met you, I'm like, what do you do? I was like, yeah. I was so I'm like, my mouth was like open. I think the whole time you were talking about it. Cause I was like, I just had no oh. idea that there was this amazing type of person out there that can help you with things that you're like, this is just normal. Like, this is the way it is. I guess this is the way it is. And I got to live with this until I die when I'm like 120. Yeah. And that, and I hear like, I mean, this is, I think this is part of what motivates me and motivates this whole profession of, of therapist, but like, it has been this story of, I just have to live with this or like all your girlfriends laugh because like everybody's peeing all the time or everybody's leaking a little bit since they had those kids or everybody's avoiding jumping jacks. And I don't think that if those things don't bother you and they're not impacting your life and keeping you from doing what you love, like, I don't want to pathologize anything. You don't need to worry about everything. Yeah. But if it's really keeping you from like being like, I really want to do that 5k or like, I really just want to go connect with my friends and not worry about this or go to Disney and not like worry about keeping up with my family. Like then those are things that we can absolutely start to address. And usually it's not complicated. Like it's for me, it's not complicated. This is what I do every day, but I can give really practical tips to help kind of connect better with your body. So you feel what's going on and you feel really connected Yeah, and also kind of know what steps to take to help yourself feel better. Yeah. I would love, I just was thinking, and this would be something great because you just recently started a podcast. Maybe you could even do like some myth busters. So I think it would be fun to like, could you share, and I don't know if you have women that come to you that like, it's always the same. Like there's like, I have a list of five things that like, these are the main things that people are coming to me for that. It's like, I just wish people knew like, it doesn't have, you don't have to pee your pants. Like you don't have to do, like, there is a solution. Like, are there a couple of things that you could share that maybe you wished you could like, just dispel this myth right now that like, you don't have to live this way to like help the mamas that are listening be like, wow, there's help for this. Like, I don't have to feel this way. Would you have a couple? I'm just curious. Uh, um, 
I mean, we're keeping this to 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Just no, no, one no. then. I, if you want to pick one and just dive in, go for it. Whatever I you think. think there's but I think a couple it'd be big ones. Yeah, yeah. I think I think leakage of any type, like leakage of any type isn't a forever thing. Like, and honestly, when you notice it and those symptoms aren't that bad, is the easiest time to get care for it. Okay. Because it's you haven't had the problem that long. It's very easy to kind of learn what to do about it. I think the other myth is that everyone is weak. Everyone's like, Oh, I just need to do my Kegels. Like, you know, I I was told to do my Kegels during birth. I was told to do my Kegels afterwards. Like I've been doing this for the better part of, I guess, almost 11 years now. And I could probably count on two hands, the number of women that I've worked with that are truly week. The vast majority of the people that I work with have more tightness in those muscles or like a lack of coordination. So the muscles aren't truly weak. It would be like, if you're, I'm going to show you my bicep. It would be like, you know, we all know we have a bicep here, right? It would be like holding a bag of groceries up here and carrying it around, you know, so it would get tired pretty quickly because right. that muscle is working. So then when you like add one more thing to the grocery bag, it just can't do it anymore. And you get a failure of that muscle. So this is the bladder, right? Like, or the pelvic floor, like people walk around feeling kind of tight all the time. And then they cough, they sneeze, they laugh, they jump, and then they leak. Right. They're not really weak, but those muscles have learned how to just kind of be a little too on and we have to retrain them to kind of just learn how to let go of some of that tension. Um, and wait, that that sounds, hold on. That sounds so, that sounds so interesting because I would think you'd want to learn to tighten them. So it doesn't leak, but you're saying you actually need to learn to let them go. So then they don't leak. I'm like, that sounds backward. Yeah. It's, that's a very, it's a very simplistic approach, but the vast majority of people don't need to just do Kegels or even do Kegel. I hardly ever prescribe Kegels, um, as an actual strength training exercise. Like I may have people do them as like, you know, awareness of those muscles, but yeah, most people don't need strength of their pelvic floor. So So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Okay. So leakage of any type. Okay. So we've dispelled that myth. Yeah. And then I think the last big one for me is that it, nothing should hurt down there. Like sex, I mean, I'm going to give the caveat that, you know, I have no judgment over anybody's preferences, like, but unintentional pain, you know, in the vagina, in the, like with penetration or even externally, none of that should hurt. And if it does, there are things to do for it beyond drinking wine, which sometimes is what people are told by their friends, their healthcare providers, like it happens. And they're just like, you just need to relax, drink some wine. It's actually a sign that there's something more going on there, whether it's a protective response, like lots of us have had experiences in our life that just, you know, that idea of just relaxing into sex can be really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but also sometimes there are those tight muscles can cause, like sore spots, like any other muscle in the body. And so if it's hurting, when you have sex, there's a lot that we can do to address that. Mm. Oh, I love that. No, this is great. Great, great, great tips. Um, because I do feel like, as you know, after you've had babies and I'm, I mean, I'm sure this isn't just something when you have babies, like anyone can go through this. This isn't like pelvic floor is only, you know, you only have issues or you only have leakage just when you have babies, like people that are not mothers, like that have delivered naturally, if you have a foster mother or however, like you can still have pelvic floor issues, right? I have never delivered babies. I've never been not, del- I've not a ad- <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> I've up. never had, I've never been pregnant. I've never had a pregnancy. I've never birthed a baby. Um, and I have had all of the issues at some point or another, which is part of what has led me to this work. And I also yeah. like, a shout out to anyone that's had, you know, like a hysterectomy, like that has been, I, I had one last year, about a year ago now. And that recovery for the most part was smooth, but they just send you home and it's like, well, you're good to go. 
And I find that a lot of people struggle with their sex life or just comfort after a hysterectomy. And like that for me has been a big learning process. And I actually started seeing the therapist that works for me for some of my own pelvic floor stuff, because I was still having some residual pain from, from the scarring. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't have to have babies. You don't have to be a mom in the traditional sense to have these issues. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make sure we said that because, you know, many times I think people might even think that, that, well, why am I having this issue or I shouldn't be having this issue or should be fine down there. It's normal. Like nothing's ever come out of it. Um, yeah, it hasn't been stretched or whatever. So I think that's important, but I would love to know, because I know, um, you know, you've said a little bit like how you got into, into this field and kind of why you were having some thing, issues and things yourself. I would love if you were to just talk about your journey a little bit, if you feel comfortable, kind of how you got to this point, because I know you talked about endometriosis, endometriosis and, um, you know, that journey and just kind of a little bit about that for, for yourself and for the listeners. Yeah. So this is the, this has been a really long kind of as things are like an onion peeling back the layers. You know, I started in my twenties with really bad, um, pelvic pain. Like t- I described it at the time. I didn't know what pelvic pain was. I described it as like tailbone pain. I couldn't sit very long mm. having really bad back pain. Um, and I, I wanted to get fit. So I started running and I was running and running was not the solution for me, but the more that I ran, the more I started having hip pain and I hurt and like everything to stop running was more painful than to keep running. And like, I finally started seeing, I started seeing everybody. I saw chiropractor, massage therapist, physical therapist, traditional PTs, um, for my symptoms. And like, I was getting a little better, you know, but I just wasn't, it wasn't really touching my pain. And I finally was working with, um, I was a baby PT at the time, and I was working with another um, physical therapist who um, I think just really understood at that time, I wouldn't have really let somebody do pelvic floor work on me with my a long kind of trauma history and things like that. Yeah. But I would go to a course and I went and I took the course and I realized during that course, um, we work on one another, that's part of our training. Um, that I was actually quite tender internally in my pelvic floor. Um, and that was a big eye opener. So that started shifting things and my pain got, my symptoms got a lot better. I'd say about 85, 90%. And then uh, I went through this kind of a long story, but I'll skip through a lot of it. I went through IVF and that actually made symptoms of my period get a lot worse. Like, I mean, to the point where I was, I was really, really sick when I would get my period, I'd have to call the whole day off. I'd cancel all my clients. I'd be on the floor. Like I wasn't sure if I needed to go to the hospital or not. Wow. Um, and I, I ended up doing some of my own reading and research because I'd seen, I'd seen a million doctors at that point. I'd seen all my fertility docs. I'd been dealing with infertility, Um, I'd seen like a lot of different GYNs and like, no one had ever said, maybe you have endometriosis. Hmm. I started reading about it and I, I realized I started putting the pieces together and I was like, I really think I have endometriosis. And I, I found a specialist in Baltimore who this is all she does. And, um, went in last year and she confirmed that I had, um, she suspected it's hard to diagnose endometriosis without surgery. Um, but she had a strong suspicion that I had it. And then we went in for surgery, um, to remove the disease and she was able like on pathology confirm that I had endometriosis and removed all of the spots of it. Um, and then I opted to, to have a hysterectomy, um, in conjunction with that procedure because of some suspected other issues that were going on. Um, but it really coming full circle, this work has kind of let me peel back those layers and really get to the root, which I believe was the endometriosis causing all the other symptoms for years. Mm -hmm. Um, But our medical system is really poorly equipped to identify and, and effectively treat endometriosis, Mm -hmm. even though it impacts one in 10 women. Wow. um, 
So yeah, that's become a, a big passion area of mine. But. Yeah. What actually is, can you tell us a little bit about what is endometriosis and like, what are some of the symptoms? I mean, you described some of yours, are those like the main, you know, symptoms yeah. that you kind of have or. So the classic endometriosis symptoms and endo can endo can be a wide variety of symptoms, okay. but the big ones are unexplained infertility. They've done a workup. There's no reason for you or your husband to have, or your partner to have, um, infertility. So unexplained infertility, um, really heavy, clotty, painful periods, like a Tylenol doesn't fix this pain. Um, and people are missing days of work. Like this is a lot of times teenagers with really heavy periods. That's my first thought is, um, we need to get this figured out. Um, constipation, painful bowel movements, um, really kind of bloaty belly symptoms, um, painful sex, I'm trying to think what the others, those are kind of the big ones. There can be a yeah. lot of water issues with it too. Yeah. Um, and what it is endometriosis are basically cells that are similar to what is found, um, in the endometrial lining of your uterus that are outside of the uterus. There is an old thought that's really been dispelled at this point, but still accepted in the medical community that it's backwash from your uterus that you're just kind of like bleeding out of your uterus. Um, and that's what causes endometriosis and it's not, but that's important because most GYNs are working off of that theory. So they're treating okay. it with birth control and hormonal suppression, which isn't how you actually treat endometriosis. Those endometrial cells, what they're, what the studies are starting to show is that we are most likely born with it. We're born with those cells. And so there's a genetic component and then also kind of like an autoimmune disease where they run in families, they run in clusters, like some people will develop them. Other people in their environment don't tend to develop them. So there's still a lot we're learning about it, but for the most part, at least the circles I'm in are really, um, really accepting that this is something that people are born with. And they often start to show first signs very early on. And then if we treat it effectively, which is removing the disease in most cases, in the same way that you would think sort like cancer, you would just want it out, right? You wouldn't want to just take a wait and see for a couple decades. Yeah. yeah. So if we can remove endo at a young age and identify these women super young, we can preserve fertility if that's a goal for them. Um, we can preserve quality of life. You know, we can keep these women active and engaged in their lives, like playing sports, being super active and work, mm -hmm. um, and just living their lives without decades of issue. Cause right now the average age of diagnosis is like 35 to 38 wow. and people have seen like 11 doctors over the course of a decade. Um, yeah. So it really seems like it needs to be something that started to talk about in like health class, like with young girls, like when they're first starting their period and things like that and that and doing like a more adequate job. And then also like getting to the moms of these females to know like, Hey, if this is what's happening and you have that open relationship with your daughter, and this is what she's telling you and your the signs you're seeing, then we need to go a little deeper. So there is some work. There is, um, and I'll send this information to you because they're going to put it on PBS, but there was a documentary that was put together on endometriosis. Um, and it is going to be right now they've been doing it in small groups, um, with a panel, but they're going to do an episode on PBS with it. And then they've created these nursing kits to send to school nurses. So you can sponsor these kits to actually send to school nurses. So they get some continuing education about it and can recognize it's also what's really scary when we start talking about limiting the ability for girls to talk about their periods before certain ages, yeah. because realistically, most girls are starting their periods a little earlier Yeah, and, and we do want them to have good information and education. Like mm -hmm. I don't remember talking about this at all. No, I remember being so embarrassed and I was like, yeah. I'm bleeding. And I was like, how do I stop it? Like, give me a tampon, give me a pad. Like I didn't, I, we didn't really talk about it. It was like, Oh my God, you're bleeding. You started your period. And like, I feel like that was our conversation. Like, yeah. And then people say it's supposed to be painful. So then the people that are really like dying of pain are like, well, they said it was supposed to be painful. And it's like, you may have some mild PMS, but these are things that you should take yeah. 
one over-the-counter pain med and be fine. If it's more than that, like there's something else going on. Yeah. yeah. So then when they do surgery, so I know you had that and then you also had the hysterectomy. So the surgery, they go in and then they take out these cells. Is that what that, they're taking That's out the endo cells? Is that the what they would do? technique is called excision surgery. And they're on, like everything in women's healthcare, there aren't enough doctors in the U S that are really skilled at this, yeah. um, but they go in and they excise, they really look at the endometriosis and they try to take clean margins around it in the same way that you would want to take like a, a tumor out, um, to make sure that they've gotten all of it or any of the little seed cells that come off of it. Um, so depending on how involved the endometriosis is, it can be different, um, procedures that are done, but really the most important thing is finding, um, finding a doctor that does this all the time. It's not yeah. an easy surgery. Um, and I, I know even it within our state of Delaware, um, there isn't, um, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. There isn't <laughs> anyone that does it to the level that it, it deserves to be addressed. Yeah. Um, okay. so I, I have four doctors that I refer to between all of Philadelphia, Baltimore, and DC, just to give you an idea. Mm -hmm. And I'll make sure your information, I know you will share that in a couple yeah, minutes, like, you know, how people can find you, but I'm sure if you, we share that and then someone wants to reach out to you or they want more information or they're curious about this, then they can be like, Hey, listen, like, this is what I'm thinking. You know, obviously you aren't that professional to be able to say, this is what you have, but you can make those recommendations on, Hey, you can go see yeah. these people. This is who I would recommend. I, and I do a lot with like, I tell people I can't treat your endometriosis, but what I can do is treat the secondary stuff that happens because of it. I can help ease the pain and discomfort that you're having. I can help really kind of clean up some of the, like the pain that happens. Cause we know pain starts to spread when you've had yeah. it for a really long time so that people can get a lot more specific with their doctor about what specific symptoms they're having. And that really helps their doctor be a lot more prepared going into the surgery to plan and, and know for sure. So I'm yeah. always happy to be a resource. I love working with, um, with women that come to me, either knowing they have endo and have had surgery or women that are like, I feel like there's more going on than just back yeah. pain. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So yeah, we could, um, you know, go on forever about this, <laughs> but I'm always like aware of time at the same time yeah. and the women listening, I'm like, I'm sure they would listen for four hours, but yeah, no, we'll I have to have you back to talk specifically again. But is there anything that, I mean, we've covered so many different things and, and all the great things that you do. Is there anything that you haven't shared or any like last, you know, tip or like, you can do this, like whatever to yeah. like the, the mamas and the women that are listening out there. I, this is something I, I find myself saying all the time is that really just trust yourself. Like you're the medical community, myself included, our, our training is incomplete. And I think that really trusting it, it has to be a team approach. It really can't be an expert, like, like having us on different levels. Like you are an absolute expert in your body and what you're experiencing and what you're going through and what's worked and what hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And your healthcare provider in an ideal world is meeting you on that level, trying to understand what's going on. And I know from personal experience, that is not the experience I often have. And it's frustrating, but really trust what you are feeling. If something's really bothering you, or it just feels like you haven't gotten to the right answer, keep searching, yeah. trust that intuition. Like, I think that I call it mom tuition, but I think that mom tuition is like, I, it's powerful. So yeah. trust it. Yeah, no, I, I love that. It's so true. And you just, you have to advocate for yourself. I mean, you advocate for your children and your kids and do all the things for them. It's like, you have to advocate for yourself. Like you just have to, and maybe the, the age is, is 33 because we don't advocate for ourselves enough until then, you know, or we don't know enough. So I think starting earlier is always better in getting that knowledge out there so that we can hopefully prevent maybe more women at a later age going through it and that infertility and things like that. So thank you so much for, for everything that you shared. My final question that I love to ask all of my guests is, you know, we, as women don't celebrate ourselves enough and we celebrate our friends and we're cheerleaders for our kids and all those things, but sometimes we just don't celebrate ourselves. So I would love to know what is something that you love about yourself right now, Megan? Oh, I love, 
I love the like curiosity of my spirit. Like I'm always open to learning more and doing things a new way. Um, but really kind of also I've moved into the space of really trusting myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that paired with the curiosity. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Awesome. Okay. So everyone's going to want to find you. So what would you say? And like I said, I'll make sure this information is, um, is listed below, but what is the best way for, for the women to be able to reach out to you? Um, my, my website is Dr. Megan and no, it's Megan Anderson, PT.com. Okay. Is, is the easiest way there's links on there to, um, either message me or to, um, schedule discovery call. Okay. Um, and then my social media is Dr. Megan Anderson. Okay. And like I said, I'll make sure that that's in the, the show notes. So it's easy for women just to click on because I'm sure everyone listening is like driving right now, or we're doing something else or out for a walk or whatever. We're probably multitasking, even though that isn't always the best way, but sometimes it's the only way, um, especially to do things for ourselves. So thank you so much for being here and sharing all this amazing knowledge. We'll have to have you back for like a part two at some point and see like, what have you found out? What are you doing now? Like what kind of new research is out there that you've discovered? Um, and just share all that because I think having these conversations is really important. Yeah. hundred percent. Thanks for awesome. having me. Yep. Thanks so much. Bye.